announcements. Okay, so it is my great pleasure to introduce <coughs> Professor Daniel Niles from the Research Institute for Human Care Nature in Toto. <coughs> Daniel received his PhD from Clark University in uh, 19... 2007. 2007, yeah. sorry. <laughs> 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 we actually worked together at the Research Institute for Human Care and Nature when I was <clears throat> doing a project over there. Um, <clears throat> at that time, his research was more focused on um, <clears throat> agriculture, landscape, um, <clears throat> Um, contemporary <coughs> environmental issues, from which I think uh, <coughs> you started to focus on the connection between material culture landscape and how <coughs> people's knowledge <coughs> is uh, <coughs> actually part of the material culture as opposed to material culture reflecting in uh, what people have in mind. I know that this sounds like a horrible explanation to you, and I'm sure that Daniel can explain it in a much more elegant manner. So please welcome um, his talk titled Return of the Basket on Art and Environment. Okay, thank you very much, Nico. Um, um, yeah, thank, thank, thanks so much. Um, uh, this paper has caused me all kinds of trouble. Uh, I was looking forward to talking about baskets. And since I knew that I was going to be able to come here, and um, then I've been regretting it, uh, writing this abstract and using this title ever since. So um, I feel it's a great chance to uh, give you kind of a first round of my thinking so far uh, about baskets. But before I do that, I'd like to um, thank, um, in particular, um, Kent and Lisa and Junko for being my hosts, my co-hosts. Um, it's really just been a, it's a pleasure. It's kind of a dream for me to be here. Um, it is a dream in a way because um, this department is, uh, s baskets have such an important position in the history of this department and baskets have been kind of a fascination of mine for some time and so I thought okay it's the perfect chance to finally uh, do some more thinking about baskets. Now, um, but <laughs> strangely last night as I was kind of thinking why is this paper just so difficult I realized it's because baskets you know, they appear to be very uh, uh, mundane, fairly uh, uh, simple uh, in a way. Um, that's awful dark. Is that okay? <laughs> that's what we usually do. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, so and it's yeah. partly for recording. We want you or want full or half. I, I I don't know. As long as you, you prefer. This is how we always do it. Exactly. Like, then, 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 no. then I think that it would be <laughs> even better. All or nothing. Um, so um, basically, um, yeah, baskets are really mundane, but they're also strangely um, tricky. Uh, and um, they have a way of kind of uh, resisting, um, even kind of resisting the gaze in a way. I go out looking for baskets all the time, and um, you, they kind of have a way of taking themselves out of view, or somehow um, a kind of self-effacing character about them that I find really uh, attractive, actually, um, and interesting. So here I'm uh, trying to use some of my experience, especially in thinking about um, Japanese bamboo baskets, to talk about baskets in general. Now, uh, California um, is, of course, one of the kind of meccas in basketry. And this um, is one of the earliest examples on record. It's in the Museo de America in Spain. And it was collected um, probably in around 1791. And it's given um, um, credit as being really among the first to be collected. Uh, but I, I think that they must mean collected essentially um, in person from living people, because there must have been um, all kinds of archaeological uh, evidences. Um, Baskets, you know, in archaeology, I get the sense that baskets play kind of second or third fiddle, but um, they're ubiquitous in the ethnographic record. People everywhere have used baskets to do many, many, many things. And in fact, the life of California, 
over the long term would have been completely impossible without batteries. In fact, it's, 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 you probably can say that they're the most important technology that existed in California history. Um, they were used for everything. And, and in particular, the two principal uh, lifeways surrounding uh, the collection of acorns and um, the collection of seafoods um, would have been, uh, or baskets were completely involved in all of those, in the gathering or catching, in the carrying, in the storage, in the cooking, in the, um, uh, in the serving of, uh, of them. And, and of course, for so many other uses, but they're absolutely essential to uh, life here. And it's interesting when you look at these very early baskets, um, here's another one um, that apparently is collected in uh, the late uh, 18th century that um, resides in the British Museum, which should really be uh, ashamed of itself at, in that um, they provide these atrocious photos of the images of the, of the object. It's really um, difficult to get much of anything out of that. But one thing that you do get when you look through this small collection and the, and the collection, both of which are online at the Museo de Americas, is that um, the baskets that they've collected, many of which are from Southern California, have an awful lot of, um, of this kind of natural ground. And the designs that you see on them are very concise, um, very, um, uh, 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 dis let's say, well, concise is a good word, um, uh, and powerful. Um, they're not the kind of very complicated, ornate, and even what begin to seem sensational baskets that maybe we're more familiar with, which are collected about 100 years later. And I don't want to do too much on this, really, but um, here uh, is an example of those kind of la later baskets. This one itself actually may not qualify. It's collected fairly early uh, in, the, in the 20th century, and it could actually precede the so-called canastomania, which struck California and California collectors in the early part of the century, the late 1880s, 1890s, early part of the 20th century. And baskets then went from being these very, very utilitarian objects to being essentially um, things that could be collected and that were worth quite a bit of money on the, on, the, on, the, on the market. And so there were, on the one hand, new livelihood opportunities open to Native American peoples and especially Native American women's, women. And on the other hand, many, many collectors, kind of basket rustlers, dealers, galleries, and tourists who were coming out to California um, and trying to you know, find baskets in every house. Um, and that, um, it's suggested um, by Moen and others, has an impact on the form of the basket, on the character and the qualities of the basket. And so here's a nice little passage that says um, the following. The selection process works two ways. Travelers choose what will fit into their baggage. Basket makers, sensing a good market, develop ranges of small, fancy baskets made especially for sale. The forms and, and patterns may start out as copies of larger baskets in regular use, but often they move in completely new directions. The tourist does not need a burden basket, but she might use a shopper. Shapes are more appealing if she can relate them to something in her own culture. Patterns are insignificant so long as they are believed to be Indian. So tourist baskets can become a vehicle for experimental, non-traditional designs which perhaps is not a bad thing in and of itself, but it does show you that there is a basket out there. There's a, there's a context out there in which the basket, uh, into which the basket is, is changing, uh, is entering and is changing. And this might have something to do with the disavowal. Um, it's fairly um, uh, declaratory, uh, if I can say so, from um, Kroeber and others, in particular uh, Barrett, who writes the first dissertation in the Department of Anthropology, the first dissertation in California in anthropology, and who kind of go out of their way to um, avoid a kind of interpretation of baskets, interpretation of the significance of baskets to people in this place. And here's Kroeber's little summation of his student Barrett's uh, dissertation, which is quite a remarkable document. If anyone still cherishes the belief that patterns were put upon baskets by the California Indians for religious or symbolic motives, or that their significance is ceremonial or poetical, 
The idea will be dispelled by a glance at Dr. Barrett's data, in which the thousands of monotonously commonplace and concordant names are unbroken by even a single instance of symbolic interpretation. And that uh, sets the tone. And I don't think that we ought to over, uh, uh, overdo this in a way, but I think that this is more an indication of essentially uh, the scientific viewpoint at that time and essentially a kind of um, what is uh, a newly arrived people's attempt to interpret or to at least to see objects, but having essentially no uh, or very little um, lived experience of the basket. For some more of that, Japan is a great place to go. Um, and here is a site, um, the earliest um, wetland middens site uh, in Japan, and also um, a settlement site that uh, Jimpo knows very well. I think that you were involved directly in this excavation. And um, in this little pamphlet, I do not know this place uh, well, I wouldn't say at all, uh, in Western Japan, but in this little pamphlet, uh, I uh, really love it because here it features the basket makers of Jomoku around 7,000 BP. And what is really interesting about this basket, about this site, and about the basket portfolio um, or pamphlet is that it gives you some examples of the baskets themselves as they're found on site. And they are um, about 750 baskets found on this site, according to the pamphlet, among many, many, many thousands of other objects. But here you have an example of baskets made from tree materials and vines um, in which um, the, uh, many of which were used for um, acorn storage or nut storage, some of which were found with still uh, nuts inside of them. And what you see in these um, examples is that um, the weaves are, are defined and refined. There are today in Japan about 12 or so weaves which are commonly used in, ba in bamboo, basket, uh, uh, bamboo basketry. And here they have an example uh, 7,000 years ago of five of them already developed. And not just developed, but really refined. And so we can say easily that this type of basketry, that these type of examples demonstrate a good familiarity, a fine development, in fact, something that has developed and essentially remained the same over the course of the last 7,000 years. On the other side of Japan, the far east, at the Sanai Maruyama site, certainly the most famous of the Jomon sites, archaeological sites, uh, is this basket. And this basket is made of wooden fibers, as you can see there. And it was found with a nut in it. It's a kind of a nut pouch. It's, a, it's only about this big. It was featured in uh, one of the high, it was one of the highlights in this recent exhibit at the Tokyo National Museum. Um, just concluded a, a, a month ago or so. Now, if at any time, as archaeologists, you feel that the world doesn't pay close enough attention to your ideas, to your findings, and to your knowledge, you should go to an exhibit of Jomon uh, archaeology or artifacts at the Tokyo National Museum. Aside from being a large museum with grand halls, large stairways, and enormous galleries, there are tens of thousands of people at this exhibit every day. It is so full that you actually have a difficult time getting at the objects. And of about the six or seven highlights of the exhibition, our basket here was included as one of them. It was the only non-ceramic piece to be featured in that way. It's only this big. The other objects are, the, of this kind, the very famous, the very flamboyant, the sensational. And uh, here you have this humble little basket. Now, I thought that basket was really um, amazing. And in fact, I went there to see this exhibit because I knew this one would be there. And I also thought it was very uh, uh, interesting because I had just recently found this basket, which also is made of uh, tree bark. It seemed to me to be um, 
probably a Japanese cypress, but I'm not sure about that. In any case, uh, I couldn't help but see, wow, that seems an awful similar thing. And it was sold to me in this uh, antique market with this um, lacquered um, container, copper lined, which is often found in flower containers. So it was sold with the idea that it would be a uh, flower container, but I kind of think that probably it was made for some other purpose. I'm not sure about that, but it seems, hmm, it seems likely to me at least. And um, huh, I thought, what can we make of that? You can pass this one around. Especially as I had also seen, oh, just about the same time, this basket, another wooden basket. Now this one is made originally, I believe, this is also sold as a flower basket, and it has this little hook on there, which may or may not be original, but um, this one was sold, uh, as, as I understand, was a kind of um, hatchet sheet that would have been carried at the waist and used as a regular thing. Now, it's hard to put any age on these things. They can be, oh, from decades to even a couple hundred years old. Um, when you see things uh, dated, uh, see things of this kind dated, you can be surprised sometimes, wow, that's three or four hundred years old, but I have no way of really knowing. Anyway, we can pass this one around as well. Sorry, that's part of the reason the lighting is... Uh, so, Dan, is there a big market then? Is that a, in terms of, the, of these baskets? Well, something like this, um, no. I mean, they're waiting for the basket lovers to show up. But there are a certain number of basket lovers. Yeah, yeah they can, I mean, you, you do tend to see in antique shops baskets, but not often do you see really remarkable baskets. And baskets like this, as I said before, are, they're pretty subtle. I mean, they're not screaming out for attention. So you have to find them, and then you also have to do the thing which is, uh, the kind of the magic is um, to agree, okay, yes, uh, I'll give you a hundred bucks for that. Mm -hmm. Or something like that, which you know can be uh, an added, you know, kind of disincentive to appreciate the thing in the moment. That it's going to cost you a little bit of, oh, sure. you know. So um, anyway, I think these both baskets, both of these baskets are just great, and I love them in particular because they are like um, messages. It seems to me that um, the ideas that were already present and developed here have somehow remained current, have somehow stayed alive. And uh, that uh, they um, that, that that there's a there's an experience it seems to me within them or that they indicate that somehow has remained uh, 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 relevant despite all of the changes in Japanese history and the world and the world history this time and so there's an aesthetic quality which I want to return to later but I also think that it's really useful to think about these baskets as being tools first. And there are various ways that you can go about doing that. One of them, um, uh, I was reading recently a book by Gilbert Simondon, kind of philosopher of technology. And he asks us, and when we're thinking about technology, to think about the technical object as defined through its genesis. And this to me seems very interesting and kind of similar to things that others have said. For example, uh, Tim Ingold, who says we should consider the object in relation to the current of activity in which it properly and originally belongs. So, when it comes to basketry, that is a pretty interesting process. And here, um, I had the chance sometimes in Japan to work with a scientific illustrator. And these are, are just our first um, sketches of when we have begun to think about um, how to um, talk about the genesis of baskets. <clears throat> and this is an attempt to reflect the idea that baskets are made. They have two surfaces, an internal and external. And they are co-determined simultaneously by the materials of which they're made, its tolerance for twisting, for bending, and for nodding, and the thing that the basket is meant to contain. And it's this relationship between the materials of which the basket is made and the thing that goes in that gives the basket its significance, its utility, and also 
its form, its aesthetic look, its, its appearance. So Ed Rosbach in his book, Baskets of Textile Art, which is kind of a foundational work here, says, for example, the traditional process requires time and a stable existence, one season to the next, and a general sense of the appropriateness of the activity to the total life. Certain grasses at certain times of the year, selected and sorted according to certain standards, looked at certain seasons, in certain moist atmospheres, according to certain techniques, into certain forms, with certain decorations for certain purposes. OK, yes, that seems all uh, very helpful. And we can also see them as, in the same time, this, I, this uh, solution to how to uh, solve a particular problem, how to uh, store something, to carry something, to catch something. And as I said, we have this kind of co-determinancy of the material or this balance between the material and the thing which goes inside. A basket that's made with both the material and the object that it will contain or the t task that it will fulfill in mind would have its own form, its own weave, its own pattern, its structure, its look, and also its own associations, all of which would be inseparable from the material and the place of which it's made. So baskets are linking together place, season, material, food ways, tastes, also social practices that are associated with being in a particular place at a particular time. And at the same time, baskets are, we tend to focus on them as objects them, themselves, but actually baskets are always about kind of something else. They are about ways of life. They are about, they have facilitated ways of life in particular places, and they have translated that ability into material form. And in a sense, then, we can say that baskets are really about how to live here. This, perhaps, is why when you talk to basket makers, or when you talk, uh, when you look at the literature, the much more contemporary literature about Native American baskets in particular, you get often such statements as to understand and appreciate Native American testimony fully, one must make the transition in thinking from materialism to spiritualism. And that seems to make perfect sense. So, coming back to Japan, what really stimulated uh, uh, this talk, or the frame for this talk, was this sequence of three exhibitions. There have been, in recent times, in Tokyo, uh, sorry, in New York, in Tokyo, in, in Paris, very sensational, if I can use the, if that's the right word, exa um, exhibitions of Japanese bamboo baskets. The first one was at the Met. It was in the Japanese wing. It took over the entire Japanese wing of the Met. And apparently, it was one of the most popular and most successful exhibitions in the Japanese wing's history. They provided a bulletin, a special bulletin, um, uh, uh, featuring this exhibition. They sent out 110,000 of those, and then there was so much demand they had to reprint. Um, I went there, I saw it. It was an ex exhibition which um, focused really uh, on the, the Japanese baskets, beginning with the flower arranging baskets that, that are made starting in the beginning part of the 20th century and going through the kind of golden period in the, around the middle of the century and ending up here in this contemporary abstract sculptural works. That was followed in April with this exhibition in Tokyo at the <coughs> Musei Tomo, which is a kind of decorative arts museum, quite a fancy place. If the Met is a, is, is, is a, is a, is a, is a generalist, it's a popular museum, it's something devoted to world cultures, this one is really devoted to the decorative arts, um, especially the Japanese decorative arts. And here, in this exhibition, it seems as if they are entering in with their, uh, with their focus on two principal basket makers, uh, Isuka Rokansai in the east, in the Tokyo area, and Tanabe Chikunsai the first in the Osaka area. These were the two um, kind of original, two of three really original um, flower art baskets uh, uh, centers of production. And here you see a bunch of examples. All of those are made by Rokansai, who, in my view, is one of the great geniuses of 20th century arts. He is spectacular. His works are just 
uh, uh, well, they just kind of defy description. They're really just, just amazing. Um, anyway, their, the museum here, their task, their, their clientele is um, uh, quite an educated, at least in uh, the traditional Japanese arts, population. And here they are um, with the first dedicated exhibition in Japan, um, especially at a museum uh, in Tokyo, in about 40 years, um, kind of entering bamboo basketry into um, the, 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 the pantheon there of, of the great classical uh, Japanese arts. And they do that with this amazing um, dark and spotlit exhibition and the selection from some of the top dealers in Kyoto and Tokyo and um, a few museums of these really, really um, prized pieces. Uh, this one recently sold at auction to a dealer in Kyoto for uh, 300 and some thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So baskets have now suddenly arrived. A piece like this, I mean, this is an exquisite and really uh, there, are, there are apparently there are two of those. But this one is owned by one of the collectors in Tokyo and it is simply not for sale. He's been offered vast sums for it and he just will not, will not do. And that's where bamboo basketry is going, and especially with these people who are considered to be um, just kind of genius uh, bamboo artists. There was a period in Japan around the middle, uh, in the early, in the 20s, in the 30s, in which artists who could have done anything and oftentimes were trained in painting, in classical painting, maybe in Western painting, in poetry, in calligraphy, could have done any of those things but chose bamboo. And the works that they produced were really just amazing. So I'll show you a few of those in a minute. And then finally, um, coming next month, opening at the Musée um, Quai de Marly, or Quai Marly uh, in Paris, the principal ethnographic museum there, is this kind of strangely titled um, uh, uh, exhibition, uh, Bamboo Art in Japan, Cleaving the Air. And here, their kind of tagline for the first time in France, an exhibition paying homage to the little known art of, of Japanese bamboo basketry that tells the story of how basketry became sculpture. So here's an ethnographic museum, which is now kind of uh, uh, doing actually what I think the French ethnographic people have done quite a bit, and is taking some object from one context and bringing it into a, a kind of Western art history. It's kind of a, I, I, this one is just opening. I hope I can uh, go to see this. But um, you begin to see that there are some kind of interesting, uh, we can say, um, appropriations or uh, uh, approaches at least to um, a tradition of art. Um, it's hard to know exactly where that is going. But in any case, bamboo basketry, when it does attract people's attention, does something which is pretty unusual in the sense that um, it stimulates people uh, in a way. There's this great phrase uh, by John Carver, who's a Native American art critic, in, uh, who goes out of his way in his review of Native, of contemporary Native American art to include Japanese bamboo basketry, which he says, bamboo baskets woven for millennia have evolved into one of the most sophisticated, most traditional, and simultaneously most innovative art forms on the planet. And that is kind of consistent with this kind of overflowing review that occurred in the New York Times about the show at the Met. One of the world's most complete and resonant art forms. Wow. So let's look at a few of these baskets. Here is one, um, uh, the original, this is really kind of what would be considered a classical flower basket based on Chinese forms. This is a story that I really don't get into in any, date, uh, in any detail, but um, in the early part of the 20th century, um, there was quite a bit of interest in the kind of um, Chinese Ming Dynasty literati and the people who, uh, kind of poet philosophers who would use philosopher's stones, um, hanging scrolls, uh, miniature landscapes of various kind, and flower arrangements in baskets as um, objects to stimulate their, their philosophical and poetical contemplations. And these forms were defined then in China. They were oftentimes seen in scrolls, and the original tea uh, masters would ask accomplished bamboo craftspeople to produce something that looked like this one here on the scroll. And so you get a reproduction and a slight uh, kind of adaptation of classical Chinese forms, um, kind of reinterpreted slightly for 
a Japanese sensibility. Another one here, quite an unusual uh, diamond shaped opening and just a really elegant uh, 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 kind of scalloping to the body. Both of these baskets are plated. And then you begin to see um, uh, people taking techniques. This is the son. This is Chikunsai II. He, whoops, whoops, whoops. He is, um, well, I had a little image. He's the son of Chikunsai I, the one whose basket is featured in the lower part of the, um, uh, uh, of, the, of the Tokyo poster. And he takes this very fine matwork plating to make a tsubo or a kind of jar-shaped uh, 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 basket. And you begin to see people playing around um, with uh, the forms and the weaves and going in many different directions and really doing um, what we in the West are oftentimes tempted to do when we look at Japanese art and say how modern it seems. But in any case, modern or not, that's an interesting debate because oftentimes I think it is not. But in any case, these basket makers are not making traditional baskets. They're making flower baskets, and they're reimagining the style. Here's the, the bottom view of this basket, which is quite a stunning one. Here's a basket um, made by the apprentice, um, one of the many apprentices of Chikunsai I, um, bamboo sheath flower basket in thousand line construction. So people are using bamboo. They're taking advantage of its various uh, qualities to make all kinds of different shapes. For example, this one on the left, which is really um, a spectacular one and kind of an iconic flower design uh, flower basket in the world of flower baskets um, and with large sections of flattened bamboo. And this one, which was made by Yonza Jiro, I saw this one in his house and told him it was on its side. He had made it as an object. And I said, this to me looks like a flower basket. And I happened to have a tube, so I got the tube and put it there and sent him the photo. He said, it looks beautiful. But he is, considers himself as a kind of contemporary artist and not as um, a bamboo basket, uh, as a flower basket maker. In any case, this is an interesting little example. But it begs the question of what is the similarity or what is the difference? Or how do we, how do we go from here, from these baskets, which according to my story here, are so rooted in place to those baskets which seem to be all over the place and finally to something like this, the sculpture which um, is really apparently uh, something else entirely, sculpture. And here's the hint. The hint is that these baskets, if baskets have to be considered from both the external and the internal, these baskets are different in that the problem of containment is solved by the water container. Once you have solved the problem of how to contain the thing that goes in it, the outside can do whatever you like. And in bamboo, a material which has so much uh, versatility to it, and which has been used in Japan for so many different things over the millennia, people are extremely creative. But that begs the question, if you can do anything now, what do you do? And then it's interesting to look at the kind of, at kind of central ideas, or begin to, you begin to collate through the baskets and say, OK, so what are people doing? How do we begin to understand what these forms are and what they mean? And here's a nice example. Again, another one of the sun. It's the same basket maker. One of the things that you see is that, boy, these artists are not constrained by any pre-existing idea of form or style. They go all over the place. And this, this artist is just as capable as doing these and of many others. Anyway, this basket, um, he uh, makes uh, kind of early on assuming his, his formal artist title. It's called Mountain Path. And uh, when you look at this basket a little bit, it has a kind of a more, uh, it has the, you know, this kind of rough or coarse open weave. It's random. And uh, it has this long length, which circles around the width of the basket three times. And you might just barely be able to see, but it's kind of scarred and scuffed up. These um, bamboos would oftentimes be uh, reclaimed from old farmhouses where they would have been smoked and preserved and patinaed over the centuries. 
and he and other basket makers prized that material and the color and would reuse them in their baskets. And this one is kind of scarred and scuffed. It's been well worn and well worked. And so the basket is entitled Mountain Path. So you see a kind of uh, 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 homage to rusticity, to country life, and to um, the kind of everyday objects of the traditional uh, Japan. Here's a basket by the elder brother of, uh, of uh, um, Rokansai in Tokyo. It's a basket which is entitled Potato. And it's meant to look more or less like a potato. Now, you have to, I find myself quite impressed at the artists who have such cultural cachet and really such incredible skills who will, um, with a kind of affection and it seems a sense of, uh, of humor and warmth, make such humble uh, shaped objects. But at the same time, this basket is kind of deceptively uh, plain and simple. The weave, um, you can see that the weave, uh, uh, the verticals are kind of moving in two principal directions uh, diagonally. And these ones heading off to the left direction skip outside, the ones to the right never do. And there's a kind of formal, there's a, there's, so there's a method, there's a pattern which is, which, is, which is almost sensible there, but there's a regular method that he has uh, used. And the basket has a kind of looseness uh, at, 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 at the same time that it gives you this kind of representation of the image. It seems kind of less woven together than almost uh, gathered up kind of in a single breath. Here, other artists, one of uh, this basket on the left in the shape of an eggplant. This is a gorgeous uh, handle there. And the one on the right in the shape of a double gourd. One, of course, of the oldest and most useful of plants uh, around. And then uh, this basket, which I have seen recently. This one, if you know uh, Japanese food, you may or may not know of natto. Natto is a fermented. Uh, soybean, it's a high uh, protein uh, um, and high kind of uh, antioxidant or whatever uh, food. And um, you um, would find that traditionally packaged and maybe even fermented in a rice straw package. Inside there would be this gooey uh, 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 bean uh, paste, really stinky, um, but people, uh, especially children, tend to like it. Anyway, this is definitely a kind of a country home food. And anybody who knows um, natto would recognize this thing immediately. And it can, couldn't help but kind of make you smile. And it also shows a kind of humility uh, in the ideas that um, bamboo, which is kind of considered traditionally, or oftentimes, at least in the art world, to be a kind of a noble material here, is masquerading as regular old rice straw. Then there's something else, and this, this, is, this is slightly different and perhaps a little bit further afield, but also very interesting. These two baskets here. Are almost identical, are a kind of reverse image, are a kind of reference, or something like that, to the most uh, recognizable form of uh, Japanese ceramic. One of the oldest ceramic traditions in the world, and baskets uh, and pots uh, of this kind. There are so many different examples. But here on the right, at least, is one around uh, 4,000 years before the present. And here we see in 1930 that artists are still using them as a, a, a kind of a reference, it seems, a kind of translation uh, of, uh, uh, of ideas from the past. And when you begin to think about these objects as being involved in some kind of dialogue, uh, things become more interesting. And in fact, you begin to uh, be able, I think, to trace ideas across the realm of material culture. So you see a kind of uh, dialogue between tree and bamboo, between pot and basket, between fiber and clay, between the ideas of nodding, the techniques of nodding, a kind of internal dialogue between objects and elements across the media and through time, and between materials and forms, between patterns and textures, as if commenting on related ideas. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that this makes good sense in a way if we come back to the idea that these clay, the baskets are really about how to live here. Because Japan, like California, are territories which have been long inhabited and in which there's been a very slow uh, um, uh, evolution, uh, co-evolution of uh, food, landscape, or livelihood practices that, um, uh, on which people depended for a very, very long time. And new things that arrived were integrated into pre-existing fields of activity without oftentimes completely uh, displacing them. And so here we come, in a sense, perhaps to some idea or approach to the aesthetic potency or the aesthetic powers of objects. And I would su suggest then that what we're t when we're talking about the aesthetic component of objects, what we're oftentimes talking about is their ability in one quick moment to link up different realms of life to link up people's understandings of seasons, of place, of everyday practice, and social experience, of the passing of time, and their sensibility or sensitivity to the ever-present ever -present, uh, natural agencies that make community life possible. And the aesthetic effect or impact is really about the leaping together of those different realms of experience and making it sensible in one quick moment. And the quicker the leap, the greater the kind of excitement, the greater the aesthetic impact, and the sense of significance, and finally, the sense of beauty. So, as tools then, because they don't cease to be tools, we can see them in the sense of, uh, in addition as the sense uh, uh, that Ingold says here, as clues and a landmark that condense otherwise disparate strands of experience into a unifying orientation, which in turn opens up the world to, percep the world to perception of greater depth and clarity. Clues are keys that unlock the doors of perception. So in the last minute or two, um, I just want to say something about these exhibits, because um, none of this sensibility, uh, not the landscape, um, and certainly uh, no deeper uh, kind of archaeological history is present in these three exhibits, at least so far as I know. And instead, what we see is a move in contemporary bamboo to this idea of abstract sculptural figure. And it's interesting to note that these are almost entirely uh, 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 purchased by Americans, uh, almost entirely. There's virtually no market for contemporary Japanese uh, bamboo art in Japan. Almost all of them then comes from abroad, mostly America, although increasingly now uh, with this exhibit in Paris, in Europe. And the demand is mostly served by a gallery in Santa Fe, uh, the Thai Modern Gallery, which signs these artists to exclusive contracts and um, in a sense, um, promotes them and makes them uh, uh, able to sell uh, their kind of work, so it has to be given some credit, but also tends to, um, it seems from some of their longer term uh, artists, kind of track them into an idea uh, like this one. And it seemed to me that this perhaps could be in some way similar to the impact, if it indeed uh, existed, of the kind of canestomania on early Californian baskets. And that to me seems, um, if I may say so, a bit of a shame because you see, again, a kind of um, relatively arbitrary and contemporary aesthetic as as sensibility applied to baskets. And in the end, it leaves the exhibitions themselves, the Met and the Tomo, as being, on the one hand, it's very gratifying to see these baskets, such beautiful baskets. On the other hand, you feel, oh, still something missing, something uh, important missing. And it seems to me what's really missing there are the place values. Um, the objects themselves become uh, uh, objects for contemplation um, um, by standards which are uh, <coughs> mostly informed by uh, a kind of Western, an understanding of Western um, art history. And the, in that context, objects cannot translate their wisdom and their meanings are uh, quite opaque. And it seems to me that they're converted mostly into 
only another commodity. And this, in the world today, seems a bit of a shame because you have in baskets thousands and thousands of collected uh, years of experience, of environmental experience, that is still, it seems to me, present in them. And instead of speaking now uh, to that history, you essentially develop a new kind of commodity, a new thing, a kind of clutter in an already cluttered world. And it seems to me that this is a kind of lost opportunity to get at some of the deeper meanings of material culture. And that's my talk. While you're here um, and you're going to be looking at the Hearst Museum, its baskets. So, kind of just within a minute. So, what's your kind of what's your kind of research design in terms of how you're relating these back to the Japanese baskets? I mean, uh, yeah, because I know that's part of what you're correct. For. Yeah, you know, on arriving here, I have to say that my initial kind of proposal um, for looking at the baskets here and comes off as a bit uninformed. Um, and part of that is seeing that just how much material has already been uh, worked on, uh, developed on California baskets. And I really felt like, okay, wait a minute, uh, time to back up uh, a little bit and start to see a little more of the lay of the land in terms of the basket literature itself. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really interested to see some baskets, but I still, realize that this is a is a vast world that I really don't know very well. So it's it's slow down mode, you bet, yeah. You bet. So it's a learning definitely. curve along. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Well if you come to the Hearst Museum I hope you look at our Japanese basket collection. Thank you. As we recently got a collection of about two hundred contemporary baskets wow. uh, that were made for use in farms. Great. And that they've never been studied since we acquired them great. about five years ago or something. So great. this, this yeah. would be a great opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd love to, love to take a look. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are they bamboo? They're mostly grass. There are not too many of the art baskets, but there are a few uh, bamboo baskets as well. By the way, in the last minute, I meant to do this too, but I got distracted. Um, here is a contemporary wall hanging basket, to kind of show you a, a later version, made by Yuzaru Jiro, who did that um, kind of uh, open abstract flower sculpture. You see he does what many, most all basket makers do these days, sign the back. And this is his um, uh, kind of approach to the contemporary uh, hanging basket. And it's made of bamboo? All entirely, yeah, entirely bamboo, yeah. And rattan, the, the ties are rattan, yeah. So. Um, okay. Mm. So mm, we had a basket weavers presentation yeah. here in January yeah. at Korea um, from the Supo Mistra. Yes. And we actually had him um, in Hokkaido to do a basket workshop. Right. What really impressed me. Um, was that at the beginning of the basket weaving workshop, he said that 80% of the work is actually to collect right. the raw materials. Right. And it starts with planting trees in the forest. Yeah. So for him, yeah. it was really tied to the environment. Yes. And that made perfect sense to me, and yet it wasn't really sinking into me. So at the end of the workshop, we are cleaning, there was this tiny, like a couple of inches, of leftover, um, and I was um, going to throw it away and said, no, no, wait a second, that is very important. And that really uh, made me realize, okay, even like a couple of inches of piece of a small grass yeah. um, rope is yeah. very important. Yeah. So to what extent these artists will get that kind of sense, I think, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. how yeah. they get the sense yeah. of where the raw materials are coming from. Yes. That yeah, yeah. might be a, yes. one of the clues to yeah. link yeah, yeah. their artwork yeah. with the yes. environment. Yes, definitely. Uh, the different basket makers are kind of linked into local environments to different degrees. All of them are super attuned to the different qualities of uh, bamboo, the different varieties of bamboo. Um, and the ways that they can be worked. And in fact, when you, when you begin to look at bamboos, in fact, this guy, for example, he's on 
um, Sado Island, and he uses some varieties which are particular to Sado Island. Mm -hmm. And bamboo people recognize that right away. So, well, no, we don't, we don't, we don't have a chance to work with that material. That it would be something that was very, uh, very distinct. And some of those are some of the contemporary basket makers are um, essentially urban based. So they don't do the landscape practices, mm -hmm. but many are out there uh, in small villages and hamlets and they do manage uh, stands of bamboo and they do that very carefully. Mm -hmm. So it really does take, uh, uh, um, uh, there's a landscape uh, 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 dimension uh, of the management of the plant and definitely the same is true in bamboo that the preparation of materials takes much longer than the weaving of the basket <coughs> except for in a few uh, extreme examples where the basket becomes extremely intricate and can take months, three months, four months to do a single, a single work. But yeah, the, 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 that, that is, I think, is, is uh, consistent, please. Uh, is there or are there uh, living national treasures who yeah. are engaged in that uh, yes. uh, basket? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah there, are, there are two uh, now, two. yeah. And there have been, uh, I think that there have been six in total. Mm -hmm. It goes back, those two early, those two great masters were both kind of too early for the designation, but both, uh, but the son of Rokansai, Shokansai, he was the, named as a national living treasure. And there have been um, a number of others from the Kansai and, uh, um, and the Tokyo areas. So a few. And they, so they do, you do get bamboo baskets in those really, um, in the national competitions and things like that. That's competition basketry. So those skills are being passed on? They take apprentices and that? Uh... I don't know, um, the, the one of the current um, um, Katsushiro Soho, he's awful old right now and he's not making many baskets at all, I believe. Um, but regular basket makers do take apprentices uh, normally, and there's still there are two um, bamboo training um, programs. One in Kyoto, but the most famous is in Oita. Sorry, in Beppu, in Oita Prefecture. Um, and many of the contemporary basket makers go through that. In fact, the current Chikunsai, Chikunsai is one, two, three, four, five. The current fifth Chikunsai, who I believe is the great, great, great grandson of the first. Um, uh, went through the bamboo vocational program in uh, Beppu before assuming his title. So in the old days, you would apprentice from the age, it would, you know, people, children would start in the age of five and six and seven. And by the time that they're 19 or 20, they have all of the skills necessary. And from then on, it's a question of what they choose to do. But bamboo basketry as a whole these days is really uh, on, uh, it's had its trouble because people don't use flower baskets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the way that they did. And as a consequence, this has become the new market. And it makes really good you know, sense and Thai gallery, Thai modern, uh, you kind of can't fault them because they have supported artists uh, for some years. And at the same time, um, they're a little bit tricky. They have these exclusive contracts uh, and um, yeah, the, from the inside of the bamboo world, if you're not in Thai gallery, then you become a kind of a non-entity internationally, which is a shame, it seems to me, but that's their model. Um, I was wondering, like, the, what's the analytical kind of benefit of sticking to the category of the baskets when it's changing quite a bit? Yeah. And also, like, how interchangeable with kago and baskets? Yeah. For example, the, the Jomo one. Yeah. I was at the exhibit, it was drowned by all these other ceramic, I don't even remember, because like you said, it was yeah. so crowded. Yeah. But also, what was the Japanese title for it? Like, because when it's flat like that, yeah. it would not occur to me to think of it as a basket, because yeah. basket kind of like, in my imagination, has to have like some space, yeah. and when it's like flat, yeah. it's more like a pouch. It's like, it was a pouch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I don't uh, remember the title in Japanese. It's called Jomon Pochetto. <laughs> but in Japanese? It's in, in katakana. Katakana? Yeah. Oh my god. So, yeah. Kago, most of these, I mean, okay, the question of is kago, these are not kago, these are objet. Right, right. That's what artists say. We are making objet. So, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, uh, that they don't know, I mean, they're, they're looking for a new market, and if baskets are not the, if, you know, Hanakago are not the market, flower baskets, then 
whole jay will do if that's the if that's the new the new frame. Yeah. If you think it's pretty interchangeable, the Japanese word and the basket. Kago in English, yeah. And basket. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's it seems to be the kind of uh, that's what that's, that's the way it has been done so far. Right. It doesn't seem bad to me, but maybe I haven't thought enough about that. Yeah. Yeah, when we did the Ainu workshop, after we did that in Shiraoi, we went to Nibutani, and there um, fabric weavers were very interested in basket. Yes. For them, the distinction yes. of uh, weaving yes. cloth from yeah. uh, <clears throat> barks yeah. and uh, collecting barks for yeah. basket that was still um, yeah. no, all part of there. Right. Uh, yeah. Think, yeah. 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 See, the textile people, they especially uh, Japanese uh, original textiles, because they were using all of these tree materials. Um, they're really interesting, and I've just kind of begun to realize, oh, this is this is natural. These are these are these are uh, the same ideas mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, and the nodding, and that's part of the reason I put the picture of those knots up there because nodding ends up showing up all over the place. And you realize, oh yeah, nodding is really, really important. So it's something that easily is able to put, yeah, links these things together. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your fascinating talk. But I have a question. Yeah. Actually, this bamboo basket, yeah. actually, actually, have a very a lot of influence from. If you see the art of the aesthetic viewpoint, it's actually the tea ceremony yes. and the flower arrangement actually yes. uh, have a lot of influence. Yes. So the going back to the you know the modernization just began, just some of them actually uh, some of the philosophers in Japan just decided to see craft yeah. art yeah. in every life yeah. and other beauty yes. for arts and ethics. So this kind of very different, two different streams to understand how beauty it is. Right. So uh, what do you think about this? So right now, this actually going to the much more the art and aesthetics version. Yes. So it's completely different, actually, the um, context from the you know the craft arts in everyday life. Yeah. So right now, you are trying to juxtapose the uh, I thought, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, how do you think about that kind of differentiation of the beauty? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't. Talk about the tea ceremony hardly at all, uh, and tea ceremonies is, is is these these things are 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 I wouldn't say they're right at the center, but they're certainly an important element within the tea ceremony, um, and uh, they would have been used to set up little compositions of seasonally appropriate flowers as part of the entire complex, which would have been um, in the in in both tea ceremonies a kind of. Um, uh, uh, um, a kind of recognition of the of the moment in time and the moment together, and chance to um, to have a kind of social exchange within this explicit kind of environmental imaginary in a way. Um, and within the tea ceremony, there are of, well, there are two kind of separate tea ceremonies: the Chinese and the and the Japanese. Um, and these um, bamboo artists begin to blend them uh, together, and in terms that they take references from both kind of traditional Japanese. Uh, uh, Chanoyu uh, context and also from the Sencha, uh, the world of Sencha. And you start to see that type of thing in these baskets when the basket makers who are really trained and brought up in a market that favors the Chinese baskets begin on their own in a way to experiment with what they consider to be more kind of traditional Japanese um, aesthetics. And so you get this type of thing which is could have been used in the Chanoyu and the Japanese uh, tea ceremony, but also could have been a regular everyday kind of mushroom collecting basket. So you see a blending because in, within the Japanese tea ceremony, oftentimes you would use, you would see a kind of, and we could call appropriation, but was really more of a kind of an honoring of everyday material culture, regular rustic things that would have been brought out of in fact, one of the most famous baskets is the, uh, the Katsura uh, basket, which the founder of the tea ceremony needed a basket for a tea ceremony for the great emperor, ran down to the river, saw a fisherman with a fisherman basket, took his basket, bought it, or took it, I don't know what, and brought it in and put it on the, on, in the tokonoma as the flower basket. So there's, you know, direct, direct link, yeah. So it's, it's, it's in there, definitely, all over the place, yeah.
already. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure.